Now we, uh, you will meet few of the superheroes from the region in the field of conservation. That's my humble opinion. I see them as that. These are really enthusiastic people, very persistent in their projects, intention, stubborn, sometimes angry. <laughs> uh, but that's, uh, uh, these are all efforts for successful research, conservation, education projects in the region. So our first speaker and keynote speaker is uh, Mr. Dusan Jelic. He's biodiversity researcher, president of Croatian Institute of Biodiversity. So he will tell us uh, more about his work in the region of Southeast Europe, about the opportunities and challenges that he faced. So Dusan, please, uh, the stage is yours. So. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I need to start. Uh, <clears throat> so, hello. Uh, and good day, so yes, my name is Dusan, and uh, I primarily work in the region on uh, conservation of uh, different habitats and species. Uh, mainly I'm a herpetologist and ichthyologist, uh, but uh, I do have experience in, in, in some of the other groups as well. And, and I will try to, in a sense, show a few uh, activities, projects, and, and things that we did in the region, so that maybe you get better acquainted uh, what do we do here and what is the focus and later maybe discuss a little bit of some of the things we would like to promote more and where zoos would be really, really helpful. Uh, okay, so uh, maybe for us a very short background. So I started my uh, conservation career uh, through Zoological Society of London and uh, I am on the fellowship uh, in the EDGE program, which uh, deals with uh, evolutionary distinct and uh, endangered species. And uh, actually, this is the place where I had my first training of two years working uh, on establishing conservation teams in regions which are very rich in biodiversity but very poor uh, in uh, level of research and amount of researchers. So uh, after this, uh, actually started to uh, really focused to different regions. This is where I met my colleagues from uh, Africa, from uh, Asia, especially Nepal, where I still work. Uh, and, and we established small little teams that uh, then try to work together and cooperate. And uh, all of us uh, actually continued to work very uh, closely uh, with zoos in different uh, projects of reproduction or keeping animals, conservation and such. But I would say that uh, what kicked off my this uh, uh, way of career, so working more in uh, conservation science, and I firmly believe in uh, science-based conservation, uh, was actually a person that had the biggest influence, and this is the Sir David Attenborough, which actually uh, had a really beautiful documentary called Attenborough Arc and uh, selected uh, our Proteus sanguinus as one of the species and our project as one of the uh, focuses of his show. But what struck me most was, uh, uh, of course, when I met him and I was already saying, oh, you know, you are my biggest, uh, you know, uh, the person I want to be and, and, you know, I really, my dream was always to become like a host and, and speak about animals and so on. And what struck me, he said, yeah, but you know, it's, it can only be one, uh, David, that's where I can present lots of projects and lots of stuff, it doesn't matter. But what we need are people who actually do the research and find out all of that great stuff. And then, you know, they just give it to us and I present it in, in a really short time. And actually, that's really true. We cannot all be David Attenborough. Uh, and actually, after that, uh, focused more into the research of this area, which is really interesting. But what is the point of his words was that we don't know enough about the region. 
So actually, there is lots of stuff that could end up in a documentary, but we actually don't have any data about it. So we filmed the documentary, and uh, of course, it's available. You can uh, have a look, or it probably already did. Uh, but what I changed, in my opinion, is that definitely to go in the direction of uh, science and uh, trying to make more of the facts available to people like him and his teams. Uh, so uh, I never worked today in science, uh, and just yesterday found out that I have uh, reached 1,000 uh, citations. And I think this is great because then definitely we can use a lot of available stuff, we can work with a lot of species, we can provide the evidence and then showcase what are the main activities that could be done. And this is the point where actually we work a lot with zoos. So with Zagreb Zoo we have a really long uh, 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 established relationship and I would say that I think we don't have any projects that don't uh, actually have a cooperation within the zoo as well. Uh, so what we started with is that uh, we lacked uh, basic data, so we had to start from scratch, started with databasing, and actually as a person, as a biologist, I never thought I'll have to learn databasing. Now I already have to face that I have to learn Python and stuff like that, programming, uh, to make this kind of databases uh, really useful. But what we managed to do in this beginning is to identify at least the areas in Croatia and in the region where we have hotspots, where we have some important species. Uh, try to work a lot on actually trying to define really important areas. Do they overlap with protected areas? Which of course mainly then don't because protected areas are established in uh, a kind of political and social way and then of course often correlating with hotspots but not uh, done in a way that you first identify uh, where, where they are and then uh, move to protection. Uh, and uh, we started with some of the identification of uh, groups of species and species that where we found that there is even a, a huge amount of data that is lacking but uh, are definitely threatened and, and need focus. So one of these were uh, we started to work on the wipers of the, of the area because uh, uh, there is a specific thing with uh, dinaric karst area, so the Balkan Peninsula, and vipers, people hate them. So even if you speak with the minister 10 years ago, you know, who is in charge of the uh, environmental issues, he would tell you like, oh yes, yes, we need to protect, but you know, not vipers, they are horrible, they are evil. So in a sense, of course, they had a really huge burden. And uh, we started to work, and of course, this is the one of the first projects where we started to work with the uh, Zagreb Zoo. And if you visit, or, or you already have, you will see a very nice uh, uh, exhibition of snakes, which was done through one of these projects, actually at the beginning of this project. And uh, this is a way how we wanted to actually get them close to people and to see that they are normal living things and how they have their uh, lives. So what we wanted to do through the project, and this is part of my PhD, uh, we wanted to see how they actually manage to co uh, live together. We have three species of vipers and one uh, additional which lives very close by. And we wanted to identify uh, what are the conditions, ecological conditions, how they can actually survive in the same area. And uh, what is interesting, we during the research even discovered that we have some interesting uh, endemic subspecies. So this is uh, the meadow viper, Viperocini macrops, but this is a Croatian subclade which only occurs in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And our point was to try to see for these species uh, in the whole region, uh, mainly occurring in Southeast Europe and in uh, parts of France and Italy. Uh, so we wanted to see these small patches which are leftovers from previously very large distribution area. Uh, it's not all prob the problem of the, the, this kind of distribution is ju not just in destruction of habitats, it's also because they are meadow dwellers, so uh, this kind of very old meadows which were maintained by gra uh, grazers are no longer present in many areas. So now we have them, but the, they are very isolated populations. So we started identifying different populations that actually correlate to different subspecies, connecting them together, and developing a network of uh, researchers that can actually do throughout the whole region. And in this area, we visited the whole all mountain ranges in Croatia, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Albania, went down to Montenegro. In some of the mountains that were actually not researched uh, uh, for really long, long time. 
And uh, we established these kind of maps where we could actually see how they uh, are separated, what are the, this is actually correlates to very large uh, Neretva River, which is one of the most important rivers cutting the, the Dinari karst in half, and of course made the separation in between the clades. Uh, then we have a, uh, a second one is the uh, European adder, which is a, a common species, but actually uh, it is common, but uh, uh, has a very big problem in reduction of uh, available habitats because it occurs in places which are very interested for, interesting for people, for the human settlements and for agriculture. Uh, from uh, expectation that you would be able to find it almost everywhere in our region, this is actually the map with some, again, very isolated populations. Uh, and then uh, we have the Vipera amodites, which is the most common species, but it is uh, endemic to the Balkan Peninsula and, and the southeastern Europe. So our interest, uh, so this is the distribution of the data that we, we could collect. So what we wanted to do is uh, modeling of distribution. So this is, let's say, uh, uh, Vipera amodites. We have Vipera berus. Uh, Vipera ursini, very general distribution, and very close by we also have uh, Vipera aspis in this area. So what we wanted to see is why actually they are distributed in this way and could they actually co-occur in syntopic or uh, 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 allopatric uh, relationship uh, and what would, what would regulate this. So we analyzed all the data, I will not bore you with this, but what we found that there is a sweet point in uh, uh, altitude distribution, which was very important for these wipers, where we found that if we look at the habitats that uh, are in uh, middle ranges of 1,000 to 1,600 meters, which is quite uh, r uh, common in the Neri Karst, we could probably find locations where they co-occur all three species. And this would be the best place for us to do our uh, population analysis. Uh, we established a system of uh, analyzing the uh, amount of threat uh, to the species based on, on its ecological uh, status. So in a sense, is a species predetermined by its ecology to become endangered? Uh, and we tested this theory. So we took uh, different ecological aspects and rated them. Uh, for each of the species, and not to bore you with this, but of course the most common one, Vipera modites, turned out to be uh, uh, the least uh, exposed to decline or extinction, and of course Vipera ursini uh, uh, turned out to be the most, because it's the most specialized species. So it's a kind of ecological approach to something as uh, IUCN's red listing. Uh, so, in, in short, it means that uh, Vipera modites, with its ecological power, would over-dominate Vipera berus, and Vipera berus would over-dominate Ursini, and also Amodites would uh, over-dominate uh, the meadow wiper. So, based on this, uh, we actually wanted to define the important wiper areas, uh, also valued all of the, all of the uh, places where we found different species, and value them with their ecological status. Uh, so that means that all of the areas that turned out uh, here, that they are most important areas for vipers, means that they have either uh, a, a strong populations of very endangered species, so actually ecologically uh, more prone to decline, uh, or they have uh, all three species together and then their ecological status is combined. And it, this correlates to mountain ranges where we found that actually very small amount, uh, less than 10% of that area is protected. Uh, now it's a bit different because we also established Natura 2000, so actually this was increased through this process, uh, but only Vipera ursini is uh, actually a habitat uh, directive species, so we, we managed to get some of these areas in. Uh, and then uh, further, what we did is also did ecological niche modeling to see uh, what are the other areas where we could maybe anticipate all three uh, of these species coming together. So we did models of uh, Vipera ursini versus Vipera berus, and the red areas are always shown in all the maps actually where we could expect syntopic relationship. And to just cut it short, because like this, of course, it, it doesn't mean a lot, but these are the percentages of uh, how they can uh, occur together. And this was the mathematical proof that 
Amodites, where it is present, it is the dominant uh, species usually and overdominates the rest. Uh, oh, sorry, we don't see for Viperaberus against uh, Amodites, but uh, I, I think it was only 2.20%, uh, uh, so very small amount where uh, these two species could co-occur, and this is because Berus prefers very moist, cold areas, and Amodites is a classical Mediterranean species, so actually very expected. But the great thing is that we found three localities where we could find all three species on the, exactly the same rock. And this, uh, this is where we focused our further population ecology uh, research. Uh, okay, I'll just jump over the, the, the details of subspecies because we also had implications that some of the, these uh, species also have their additional subspecies. A general ecotypes of Vipera berus in the area. This is more of the type you would expect in rest of Europe. This is uh, the ecotype of the Bosnia nether. It has this broken pattern. So for, for people who work on snakes, the, this is maybe the most interesting. And of course, the completely black uh, individuals. And uh, again, finding this an exact percentage that around 19% of uh, uh, individuals, mainly males, are black, again, focused us towards further ecological research wise uh, these kind of uh, patterns are pre preserved uh, within the population. Uh, okay, again, about subspecies, I will just jump over it. So as conclusion, definitely Vipera uh, berus has the widest uh, distribution in the area, but uh, Vipera modites actually uh, is ecologically the strongest species. We have Vipera ursini overlapping with both of them, uh, uh, with both species in certain habitats. You can see berus and amodites very small overlap. And then there is a sweet spot, which we found is only around 0.7% of habitats. Uh, so, and Vipera aspis, which overlaps then further in France and, and, and uh, Italy, which we also calculated in, but uh, again, ha adds additional problems to the equation. I think it doesn't... Ah, okay, sorry, yeah. And what we found is that that, that actually correlates to sub different subspecies that were formed. So actually, besides that Neretva River, uh, the influence of uh, syntopic species influenced the ecological separation of subspecies in the meadow viper. So as we started our work with the, the zoo in Zagreb, then we just continued. This was first we made this collection of snakes, and then we had lots of them. They were laying eggs. They were having young. Uh, so we said, okay, now really we have uh, a lot of different additional things we can uh, do. So we started to, uh, we formed a small office, <laughs> and uh, maybe you managed to, to visit it with Ivan, uh, where we were measuring all of this, and uh, our focus was transfer of energy between the uh, mother towards the, the juveniles, and in short, uh, we were interested uh, in how much energy does she need to invest and how much of that is actually really transferred in live juveniles. So here we have an example of Zotoka vivipara. Uh, and you know it's called uh, the viviparous uh, lizard. But uh, what we found uh, actually in uh, part of the population in Croatia, they are like, let's say, semi-viviparous, but actually there is uh, an egg when we did the measurement, uh, sorry, which lasts for around uh, uh, two to three hours, and you can see it here. And on the other hand, some populations have actually normal eggs that needed more than 20 days of development, so actually not really viviparous in all the areas. Uh, and what does it depend on? Ecology, again. Uh, so we continue with then uh, developing a passion to uh, how eggs develop. And this was something we had a lot of different species with uh, developing and uh, in incubating eggs. And uh, one of the main thing is how they actually gather uh, volume and what is the exact volume of the egg. Seems simple, but actually you can check. There is actually no way of uh, really precisely calculating the volume of the egg. So it's a, it's a huge mathematical problem. Uh, but we were interested in its growth, actually, how they grow uh, from when they are laid up to when they are laid. And what we found, in short, is that actually in the beginning, if you measure all the eggs based on their volume to mass ratio, you can say if they will survive or not with quite uh, big certainty, which means you can right in the beginning separate the ones that you don't expect to develop and uh, avoid problems later uh, with uh, yeast and, and, and other development problems. 
Uh, and so we had all kinds of different species. This is one that I first time in my life saw. So this is the egg of Platyceps naiadum. It's a very long uh, snake. Uh, and of course, the eggs, as, as you would expect, have to look like this. So you would fit a really uh, a narrow, long snake uh, uh, inside. Uh, but actually for us, even the, to see how they look was the first time because this species was not kept a lot. Uh, at least we couldn't find any uh, data. There was some mentionings actually only how long it takes and, and uh, how to do it. And uh, so one of the things that we did precisely uh, were uh, uh, turtles and uh, tortoises. So we had a lot of research there again because we had a few projects working on uh, Emis orbicularis, uh, uh, Testudo hermani, Trachemis scripta. So actually, they became part of our uh, work. Then again, we had uh, uh, the smooth snake uh, eggs develop in the terrarium in the zoo. So again, we did all the measurement and how much energy needs to be transferred with them. Uh, and actually, this data is really great because you can calculate in the population how much uh, juveniles you would expect, even in nature, based on energy that uh, can be provided in that type of habitat. And that actually was important because one of the species we started on was a, a skink, the only European skink, Ablepharus kitaibeli, occurring in only two locations, very small, about the football court size in Croatia. Uh, in Europe it is more common, but here it's only these two locations. And what we were interested in, how much actually of these animals could be supported in these two really tiny localities and what we can do. And for that, to calculate it through uh, using of vortex, we needed a lot of ecological data, and some of the prime were how much uh, this energy needs to be invested per uh, individual. And can you imagine how much it turned out for this species? So it's a tiny species. Adults are just less than 10 centimeters. So throughout the year, they managed to gather enough energy for just one egg. So mainly the female has, in average, 1.1 or 2 eggs. Uh, I say in average, but mainly that's one. Uh, so, and then what we did manage to do and use this data, as I say, collected in the zoo first, and then uh, also what we needed to test in the in the zoo uh, was, uh, do we know how to breed them? If we will come to a level of population where we need to take the last individuals and breed them and get them back, because the problem is when you are left with a few individuals, what to do? Will you take them then? and risk that you don't know anything about their breeding because it does seem easy. You just get males and females together and then you get lots of young, but no, you don't. So anybody who tried it knows this is not the way. Uh, so you need lots of experience, specific experience uh, in order to breed them. So we wanted to test that and then we used all the knowledge to gather the vortex model. Uh, in a sense, vortex models just predict what will happen in the next 100 years. Uh, what we found, this is just one iteration of the model. Uh, in average, uh, so this is just one where they would survive next 100 years. This is our population size. But actually, in 1,000 iteration, it showed that there is a very high risk that they will not survive next 100 years. So we needed to do something and tested a few model, uh, models. So we calculated in the possible mortality. So like if there is one fire which would go over that small area of one football court, uh, population for sure in almost all the iterations would go extinct. And actually it's so small and very, very dry uh, Mediterranean uh, type habitat that fires are normal thing there. Uh, so we calculated that actually with one catastrophic event, population would definitely go extinct. So we uh, actually uh, started to search for solutions and model with different types of expansion of the territory. And we found that if we expand it, if we double it, uh, that in that case, uh, we could actually uh, save this, the population. Yeah. Uh, so we started first with the removal of the pines, which were actually, again, one of the problems because they can really seriously cause uh, wildfires, and they were very common in this area. Uh, so actually started to remove them, just pile them up, and actually at the end when they would just, be, we didn't extract the wood, we would just pile everything here, and actually it became kind of a place for the animals to, uh, uh, to, to breed and, and everything. So we would find them commonly later inside these areas, although when the pines were alive, you couldn't find them in these areas. And what we found is that we have two very similar habitats. Uh, so these are the main populations, uh, these two. 
And you can see already that we are speaking about isolated populations because they live in this kind of slopes of little hills, but only on the southern very dry uh, parts with oak. And actually, this is a type of habitat which is very isolated. But we were lucky to find two additional localities and transfer them in uh, around 50 individuals per population here. And we can confirm for the last uh, three years that both populations have established. And now, uh, for the first time, we will be doing the population estimate um, uh, for these sites. I, I forgot to say here, the estimate was around 18,000 individuals. Uh, Okay, and then uh, maybe to move on another project that we did a lot, and this is uh, Proteus sanguinus, very interesting uh, species of a cave salamander. And one of the things we started to do to approach this animal, because you couldn't approach its habitat, it only lives in deep caves, uh, I had to start cave diving and, and uh, actually met a really great cave diving team, and we started to develop the project to actually research the species in situ. And in karst, if you don't know a lot about karst, looks like this. Let's say you have a spring of a river, and this is in uh, Rupecica uh, area. So this is uh, its source where you can enter. It's a small cave, and then you go into water, but actually, so that goes on. It's a kind of continuous river. Here you have a sinkhole, so actually the water source is here, goes maybe 50 meters above ground, and then sinks and again just goes Further. And this is one of the biggest populations of Proteus sanguinus. So what do we do? We first needed to establish the population densities to see uh, how, to, uh, how to actually approach where do we have bigger individuals. And we do it using line transects. Uh, we do it in distance. Uh, and in simple uh, manner, you just uh, dive a certain part of the cave with a line set up. It's also a rescue line. And you count all the individuals and how far they are from the uh, the, the line itself, and from this you can actually uh, calculate what is the number of individuals you have seen against number of individuals you didn't see. Uh, if anybody is interested in more in the in the in the mathematics of it, we can discuss it uh, later. But in a sense, this is how it works. So we could estimate the total population, even in the areas, so counting in the areas we couldn't see. Uh, is, let's say here, it was 16.2 individuals, which then uh, allowed us, if we knew how big the source of this cave is, uh, actually the whole system, we could recalculate and get the complete number. So even if some parts we could never reach, so we could never dive in some of these areas. Uh, so in simple, this is what I described. So you just count all the individuals in their distance. Uh, you plot that in, in the software, and everything under the line is what you did see. Above line is what you didn't see. And then actually from this ratio, you get uh, the number of individuals. And we managed to do this and set up uh, four years ago uh, a first population estimate for the most important sites. And now, since then, we are monitoring all of them uh, two or four times a year. Uh, and you can see that some of the biggest, and that there is a very big difference. So some even have populations of uh, 7 to 12 individuals per 10 meters squares, which is really dense population. It's just like having protos all over. And this actually is the, the, the uh, highest density ever recorded. Uh, and what we found during this research, so as you see, we just move uh, uh, further and further, because what we found during these kind of dives, wow, we have some kind of fish all the time in these uh, cave systems. But uh, I already previously did work on freshwater fish, and this was one of the things I started my career with. And what we came to see is that we actually have semi-cave fish that nobody is speaking about. Everybody is saying that they are just living the sources, but actually what we found, they are cave fish. Uh, and this actually developed our uh, interest in them, and we had a few projects actually that were being more of economically developed and forced us to go to specific research, and this was one of them. We had a plan of building one of the largest underground uh, hydroelectric plants in a main source which waters the whole Dubrovnik Neretva County and the city of Dubrovnik. Uh, so they want, what they wanted to do is uh, close under the ground, make a huge concrete uh, wall, which would then raise the level of water. And for the fish that live there, they said, oh, well, that will be great for the fish, you know. It will just get, like, huge amount of water inside and lots of habitats. 
yeah, of course, it doesn't work like that. Uh, so the problem was that these fish were actually completely, when we started to do this research, uh, they are very dependent on breeding. They're not completely cave fish. They are actually semi-cave, as I said. So they still didn't develop possibility to develop eggs inside the cave. They do live 95% of time in there, but they come out for breeding in this one little small uh, part of the, of the source. And it's maybe 30 times 20 meters, uh, something like that. And they all have to come here because from this wall here that you see, down here it's already uh, brackish or marine water. So we actually started to work on uh, research and actually even some uh, work on, on trying to prevent this from happening. And this is one of the in situ uh, photographs of the, of the Dominichtis getaldi that lives there. And after that, we started to wonder, is there more of this kind of fish? And of course, looking for all the fishes that uh, live in kind of springs or were defined like that, and we found this one. It's Foxinellus dalmaticus. Uh, a fish which is endemic to only one small locality, uh, maybe the size uh, of, of five football courts, let's say, uh, in the drainage of Chicola River. So actually one big cave, which is located here, and then a very small part underneath that. And uh, there was a big project that was supposed to be done here to flood all of that. And again, we got this answer, you know, but you know, the fish will get a perfect nice lake, it will be huge and it will be perfect for fish. You know, fish live in water and there is a lake, so, uh, you know, what do you don't get? Uh, and uh, what we, of course, found, it's a very specific cave dweller, which only gets flushed out during a certain time of year. And actually, the other thing is that this river doesn't even exist for the rest of the year. It actually comes out, the water is being flushed out and the fish and everything, and in a month it's all gone. It's dry for 90% of time. So who didn't manage to get back into the cave, they are gone. And then we established this, um, actually a theory of horizontal uh, migration in dinari karst fish, which is really important. They all have to come out for breeding, but they all have to get back. And that was actually one of the, the, the things we found. It was really crucial for their survival. And where you even naturally don't have that, you don't have this fish. So then we actually uh, developed a passion <laughs> to actually work on this kind of very rare fish and, and check, start checking around the whole country. Uh, actually had uh, uh, one of the, the uh, areas completely destroyed. So we just established in this creek, uh, as you saw in the previous image, it looked like this in the year when we discovered that it's the only habitat of Teleste sufia, again, a habitat directive fish. And the next time we came, it looked like this. Uh, so we made a EU, EU complaint, and uh, this is how it looked after, like, let's say, about a week. Uh, and actually, of course, the fish were completely gone. Uh, so we, we made a European complaint, and uh, the good thing is that that's the first time, it was the first European complaint, and actually it was very successful. Uh, the uh, main agency was made to actually restore the whole habitat, and now five years later we can prove that they are actually back. So they did survive, just needed to restore the restoration of the site. Uh, and what we couldn't do is, if you just go and after what they did, you saw, just dig holes to make it more heterogeneous, uh, uh, that wouldn't work. So we just planted these huge rocks, which actually then uh, made them uh, have, uh, you know, form uh, shallow parts in front and very deep in the behind. Uh, and this is how it looks now, and uh, you can see that it does work, so it does form this kind of very heterogeneous type of habitat, and the, the animals are back. Uh, and another species that uh, maybe just to mention, this is an example where we, again, were working with WWF on one of the hydroelectric plants, uh, where we started to research just to show is, does it have an effect on fish, but at the end ended up with describing a new species from that exact locality. And this is now Alburnus uh, sava, which was, which was then described uh, after this, and it is still uh, the only locality uh, around that hydroelectric plant. Uh, it lives in this kind of waters. Now, unfortunately, this is completely uh, gone because actually all of the upper part is a kind of a lake. 
And uh, we had, again, a new complaint uh, to the European Union where actually the, uh, the agency that did this pr uh, was claiming that they didn't uh, change anything in the water course. To prove this was not true, we used the sonar imaging, uh, so you get the side uh, scan images. And to make it short, with this you can make a 3D model which we use to you know, record the whole river, make a 3D map, and we got this as evidence actually that they did flood because when you uh, record the depth and make the map of it, then you can see exactly that on each of the previous barrages that were like opened, now you have two, three, four meters of water. So exactly you can calculate how much they, uh, they changed it. Uh, and for the end, about the opportunities, this part I will just go uh, maybe very quickly because we work a lot in the region, but what uh, we now try to develop is a program to protect these freshwater fish, these semi-cave fish, and this is where we would really need some help from other zoos as well and experience. We already established some cooperation with some, uh, and uh, what we would like to make like a small uh, uh, breeding center. Uh, and these are just some of the examples. This beautiful locality is a huge cave system in Bosnia and Herzegovina on the border with Montenegro has two endemic species that this is the last locality and this is the Telestes metohiensis. Uh, it's only about uh, 60 meters of outside uh, flow and then again a sinkhole and that's the only locality. And now we dived in this cave here. It goes for around 1,200 meters and uh, still don't know, you know how far actually inside. Uh, then we have Chicola River. Uh, I mentioned it with this uh, where they wanted to build the accumulation lake. This is how it looks. So this is the time of the year when the fish come out and they breed. And then in a few months it's like this. And then at the end it's nothing. And what happens, they actually get, catch up with in the invasive species in uh, this kind of small ponds. And we did some tests. So uh, individual uh, species like Gambusia, uh, which was introduced in all of this area, they actually come. And they are much smaller than our endemic fish, like three times more, but they actually come and they pick on them. They bite their fins, they bite their uh, soft parts, and just to cause infection and, and make them die. So what we found, and we discovered this, because you would at the beginning find our fish inside, the endemic ones, but later in the season you cannot find them anymore. And then we tested this in aquarium, and they really, for some reason, and they don't even eat those parts, they really just take it off, and then uh, leave it. And this is the Foxinellus dalmaticus uh, that I was mentioning. Uh, then we have a huge opportunity in Krbavsko polje. This is one of the main uh, uh, locus typicus uh, described. Uh, so small source, you can see the size. You cannot even fit inside, and about three meter size lake where we have two endemic species. They just come out. This is a picture when they are coming out of the cave. They breed on this grass, and you can watch them. And as soon as the water comes down, they have to go back. Uh, it looks like this, so they're actually also really beautiful. This is the male during the breeding. They are like goldish color, but then during mating, they get these uh, points. Uh, then we have Yadova River. It also has two endemic species, Dalmanitis yadovensis and Telestes croaticus. Uh, Again, this is, you can check, uh, see here that this is a normal meadow vegetation. And I had some pictures of these animals breeding and I was showing it to experts and they were saying like, ah, you did it in aquarium, I can see, you know, like this normal vegetation in sounds Like, no, that's how they live. They have to come and breed on this kind of normal meadow vegetation. There is no aquatic vegetation here because in two weeks this river is gone. It's empty for the rest of the year. Uh, and then we have some big uh, rivers like uh, Kirka River, where we have now discovered that we still have some really small uh, remains of uh, a very special soft mouth trout, uh, 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 Salmotimus optizorostris kirkensis. And this is one of the species where we now have to think so, if we, there is one, two, three individuals that we can now rediscover, what to do with them. Should we take them somewhere or leave them there where already obviously there is a huge decline and, and we don't know why? Uh, and then we have, uh, again, on Kirka River, uh, a species that was described 50 years ago and never found again. Now we've managed to find two individuals again. Uh, so obviously present, 
uh, and, and even the, the species level is questionable. We still don't know is it or it is not a species. Uh, uh, it will be tested now, but in a sense lives in very deep karstic lakes. We have very small number of those. In northern Europe they are common, but here there is only two uh, natural lakes that are deeper than uh, 50 meters. Uh, and then we have uh, species that live in Istria, like uh, Romanogobio benacensis, rediscovered. So it is uh, common in Po drainage, but we found it in Mirna, Mirna River in Istria. But after genetic testing, turned out that only population in Mirna is like a clear population of, uh, of this species. So actually, uh, from that point, or from conservation point, really important to be conserved here and not in the places where it is already hybridized. And uh, for the end, something uh, we didn't even present until now. So this is one of the really most beautiful caves I ever visited. It's in continental part. And what we were thinking about why we don't have cave fish, real cave fish, you know, white without eyes. And the answer is we never in these karstic areas had a pressure of huge amount of other fish forcing them to stay completely. So ecological pressure for them to stay in the cave. In this karst polye, you usually only have one or two species at all. So for them, it was easy to be in the cave, come out, everything's fine. And then we said, okay, but let's go to a place where we have an outside river with huge amount of other species. And this is on Korana River. We found this beautiful cave. It was already registered. Uh, connects to Korana River just here, already behind me. And we started to do research here. It looks really beautiful com coming the small streams coming out. We, have, of course, had to dive still. And what we just discovered, a possible real cave fish. And I don't have anything to say. We don't have a name. We don't have anything. We just know it exists for now. And we have two samples. So that's it. <laughs> and yeah, in God we trust to others bring data. That's what we use. And yeah, we try to do that as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Dusan, for this. That was amazing. Uh, I'm still uh, very, uh, very impressed with um, invasive, uh, invasive, evil uh, species of fish. So, uh, any questions for Dusan? Okay. If I got information, good long time ago, herpes test was introduced to Mleet Islet and Peleshat Peninsula. And my question is, if uh, there are some impact of this invasive uh, animal to reptile population, and additionally, if you do have problems with other in, uh, introduced uh, invasive like raccoon or American mink, because uh, in our country, in Czech Republic, uh, their impact is very detrimental, for instance, to Tesselata and so on. We need them. It works? Ah, oh, okay. Uh, so, yes, uh, there is actually quite good data on when it was introduced uh, uh, to Miet Island and, and actually even how much individuals and, and the whole start was actually described and rediscovered very recently that during the uh, uh, time of uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, there was uh, a person who developed a whole project to make uh, Miet a national park and described in detail what are the characteristics and specifically says that one of the main problems for the area are numbers of snakes, that the, the Vipera modites, very common, and other species, so common that nobody of like aristocracy would come there to relax. And uh, probably part of that was, uh, uh, and then it is described that already uh, the, the herpes is uh, brought to the area. Uh, and I'm just saying it to show you that now when you go there, you actually don't find any snakes. So Malpolon uh, insignitus is uh, a species that is still present, but it's really fast. And what we found is lots of injuries. They are like in one fourth of individuals has some kind of damage. Uh, and, and, and they survived injuries. We found tortoises that are broken apart and then healed. So actually there is obviously a huge pressure because it's not just uh, the, the mongoose, it's also the wild boar and other species. 
Uh, the raccoon is not common uh, still here. I know that, uh, yes, uh, it's in, the, in the other countries in Europe, a uh, very big problem. We just had a very good uh, discussion with, uh, through IUCN and ASA in a project about this uh, species. So, uh, but here they are still not present. But the mongoose itself actually already came to most of the southern islands and actually in the mainland already reached Montenegro and toward the north, I think, all the way up to Split. And in these mainland areas, you still don't see the effect so clearly, let's say, uh, because they are more focused in places like wastelands and, 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 and dumps and around uh, urban areas. Uh, but the islands are the main thing where you can see it very clearly. And even uh, I, can, I can forward the paper of our colleague who was doing a specific research for, uh, I think, four islands and comparing where they are present, where they are not. Okay, and now it's uh, time to introduce uh, Dragica Shalamon. She's another very enthusiastic um, and hardworking person, and uh, she's associated uh, professor at the Faculty of Agriculture in Zagreb, uh, working on uh, in genetics. She's working uh, with uh, striped terrapin for 18 years, and I'm a witness. So uh, we cooperated a lot, uh, she worked hard, but after 18 years of work, her effort is awarded. She will tell you more about it, so I will um, leave to her. No. Thank you, Tomislav. Hi. Hi, my name is Dragica, and uh, together with uh, my uh, PhD student Anna Stich Cohen, uh, working in Association Hila, formerly known as Croatian Herpetological Society, uh, we uh, prepared a little story uh, on uh, collaborate, collaborating for conservation for you today. So, uh, this is a little stinker that we are working with, that you can see here on this slide. Uh, locally in Croatia, it's present on the uh, farthermost south in Dubrovnik Neretva County, and uh, locally they call it a uh, stinky frog in a frame. <laughs> we have the Croatian name for the uh, turtle, <laughs> but that's what it's locally called. So it's on annexes two and four of Habitat Directive, kind of compl complicated issue because uh, during the last uh, 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 15 years or so, it changed uh, its taxonomical status. It was uh, considered to be a subspecies of Moremis caspica. Uh, and the uh, conservation status in Croatia for the uh, previous report period, actually the first one that Croatia submitted, uh, is in a unit uh, uh, recorded as unfavorable bad. Uh, in Mediterranean biogeographical region uh, for the period of 2013 to 2018, it's uh, considered to be uh, unfavorable, inadequate. So uh, this whole story in Croatia regarding this species started somewhat 18 years ago. And uh, the important thing was actually the student curiosity and the instigated uh, aspiration to find more about this species when reading uh, 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 the, the um, scientific article with this map showing that we have it present in Croatia in all of the Adriatic region. And we were like, yeah, we have bunches of herbs there, but never saw that one. So, um, uh, Actually, what was found, there were only several ancient, ancient records uh, present, of presence of this turtle at two sites. And uh, uh, also what happened that year is that it was put on the red list as uh, a least concerned species. 
So yeah, it was on the red list, but when, you, when, when someone asked uh, about it, it, it's least concern, what would you want to do with that? <laughs> So um, today we know a lot about this species. It's a, a Mediterranean argonaut, so it uses uh, a sea rafts of natural material and other stuff to float around from uh, the, the mainland areas to different islands in Aegean and uh, southern part of Adriatic as well. And in Croatia we have it located, counted, assessed, threats, uh, some minor conservation uh, activities happening with the habitat and so on. Um, but uh, 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 what also happened in 2015 two, two uh, in Croatia, it was uh, 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 estimated uh, in, in a red list as endangered due to uh, different uh, reasons. Uh, so we have it about 500 animals in Croatia today. Um, you can see here one of the threats that um, depleted uh, 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 the, the uh, known historical <laughs> locations, and this is a uh, loss due to uh, bycatch and incidental killing. And we have some uh, conservational successes in this uh, period. Initially, uh, before uh, our alignment with EU legislation, it was uh, considered to be strictly protected spe uh, species in Croatia. Um, uh, we needed some knowledge uh, uh, about its uh, locations of occurrence uh, to designate uh, this valuable uh, habitats to Natura 2000 during 2013-2014. And um, it was included, one of the earliest species included in the national uh, program of monitoring. That was not a bird. <laughs> Uh, most recently, um, uh, this is one of the first species in Croatia with National Management and Action Plan, actually from November last year. Uh, since uh, January this year, we have a first herpetological special reserve uh, uh, where this uh, uh, species is designated. And uh, since two days ago, uh, we know that we have a successful uh, uh, life uh, nature application. Uh, considering in situ and ex situ uh, uh, um, activities. And this is a jump, big jump start to the formalized species action plan uh, uh, and uh, species management. Um, but I will not talk to you uh, uh, on how we got that data. It's very important to have the data. Uh, this, uh, my story is uh, focused more on uh, collaboration and, and forming the links and ties and, and, and structure uh, that, that needs, uh, that is required to get all that uh, data and start having some results. So as I said, uh, uh, youth enthusiasms uh, are important, uh, but then again, uh, the NGOs are a imp very important uh, piece of the puzzle. Uh, so uh, uh, the biology student NGO called BIUS uh, uh, reached out to um, Croatian Herpetological Society, now called Association Hila, and Croatian Natural History Museum uh, and uh, to, to find more uh, uh, about this species. Uh, further NGO contacts were pulled, uh, local ones from that Dubrovnik region uh, to NGO Chiopa. And also uh, uh, the uh, important uh, instigator uh, was uh, the Czech Society of Nature Protection with a very charismatic person, Irži Halesh, uh, who actually pointed out the importance in, of different stakeholders in, in uh, nature protection. So uh, the enthusiasm and, uh, and the, the strength are important, but uh, also uh, the working within the university with uh, strong uh, uh, biological and conservation data, building the expert knowledge on species. So we have in this period a number of biology student master thesis uh, uh, connection with the Zagreb Zoo also, uh, and to, today uh, uh, Anna is working on her doctoral thesis on uh, 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 this turtle reproduction. So what was found uh, uh, with this NGO context was this additional location that was not before mentioned in the, uh, 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 this ancient literature. And these were the Maikovi points which are today uh, 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 considered to be, uh, uh, which are today designated as a, a herpetological reserve. Uh, 
And uh, uh, it's also interesting to point out that uh, it, the, the reserve got its status uh, uh, based on the local initiative. And this local initiative was also instigated by the work of uh, uh, Association HILA uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the uh, influence of uh, Yirji Halesh, who showed all, all of the important people where you have to go to. So the, the municipality, the hunter society, the teachers in the school, and everyone. Uh, so a lot of education uh, and local, uh, local uh, awareness raising was uh, done in this period. Um, eco schools, uh, lo uh, local female societies like Desha Dubrovnik, agricultural clusters, uh, local firefighters who were helping with the uh, uh, habitat, uh, with the uh, pond uh, uh, cleaning and uh, restoration, football club who got very proud and interested. And um, uh, in the period when that uh, started, also the public institution for uh, protecting designated uh, uh, nature areas in Dubrovnik Neretva County was also founded. And uh, after uh, um, uh, Natura uh, 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 2000 areas in that county were designated to 14, uh, also uh, we became very much uh, uh, involved with them. So you can see here this little uh, uh, logo is the logo of that uh, uh, institution. Uh, so um, around the association HILA, a small avalanche of continuous local and regional activities uh, were uh, happening in this period. And uh, all of that was uh, recognized because it brought a lot of data <laughs> and supported by the sector ministries. And I say that in plural because we had a lot of changes there. At one time, we were even considered uh, under the Ministry of Culture, together with literature and pictures. And <laughs> So um, a lot of diverse stakeholders and authorities across different sectors is something that the NGO uh, can connect. Uh, they do not usually hang out together. <laughs> so the most common direct ties of the association HILA aggregated. Uh, so uh, we have a, a Zoo Zagreb now in this uh, uh, upcoming period uh, that will be working uh, in situ and ex situ. Uh, with nesting sites and predators, mangoes also, <laughs> breeding program uh, for the population reinforcement. Uh, we have a, a faculty of agriculture working in uh, genetic and breeding, in fishing bycatch mortality, uh, uh, alleviation, in invasive alien species, um, uh, invasive agricultural practices, and so on and uh, the public institution for the management of protected natural areas of Dubrovnik Neretva County uh, uh, with the three des species designated sites and one where uh, a lot of work is required for the population uh, is crucial for engaging uh, the local community uh, uh, and creating a volunteer program so uh, the newest member uh, of this uh, uh, task force uh, is actually uh, Hrvatska Voda, which is a national authority for water management, uh, and they will be working on improving, improving this uh, uh, and monitoring uh, wetland uh, uh, habitat quality. So from unfavorable bad uh, in Croatia today, we are looking forward to uh, life for Maremis, uh, and this is a acronym of the project in the following four years. And I see now that I have the same image as uh, Dushan before me in the slide. So uh, Zoo will uh, sh sure, uh, for sure in the next period uh, have some new photo opportunities of, uh, of hatchling, hatchling Mauremis uh, to, to, um, to get. And uh, as a showcase for collaboration in nature protection, I guess all of you here are very experienced, uh, but um, uh, we're like a baby's 18-year-old baby in this game here <laughs> now. Uh, um, what we learned is that the best uh, ideas actually need maturation time, but also general conditions to be met. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, we were coming to European Union, a lot of legislative changes there and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, in order to give uh, rise to some action and change uh, 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 and uh, success in, in, in conservation, 
but what is also important is that international collaboration can shorten this maturation time required. And uh, that's uh, why we're also excited uh, uh, to start with our project and also start working with uh, uh, countries that uh, uh, have this population, like Montenegro and Albania. So uh, that's a short story on Mauremis. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and here you can see the new herpetological reserve in Croatia. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dragica. So we will hang out a lot yeah. in the future. Oh, no, don't run, don't run. Uh, let's check if there are some questions for her. Okay, again, we have. Come on, come back. I just want to say that it was very He was yeah, yeah. in the conference. He's so. a very strong personality. He even uh, uh, locally, uh, he uh, was awarded a, a, a life award for uh, his work in Mykovi. Some more questions? Uh, okay, if you will find some more questions, uh, Dragica will be here today with us. You are coming to the zoo? Okay, she will be at the zoo, so you can catch her behind uh, some enclosure or whatever and <laughs> ask the questions. Okay, and now it's the time for a big showman. Uh, I must say my really dear colleague, um, reptile freak. <laughs> Sorry, I need to tease him. So Ivan Cizel will tell us uh, about the Proteus project, about the cave, our uh, endemic cave, cave salamander, very, very charismatic species, which is umbrella species, and he will talk about the co uh, cooperation between uh, different types of specialists and why is that important in such projects. So, even the stage is yours. What should I do? Escape. And now, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can broke everything, yeah. even computer. We okay, it's here. sharing pictures. Yeah. Recycling the same ones. There. Yeah. F5 now, and it should work, or? Because you cannot move it to the side, can you? Yeah, but it's, all, it's there, but yeah. you can't see anything here. Hold on. Yeah, or I can use this as well. Hi, everyone. Reptile person that is talking about amphibians. So just a short uh, presentation about cooperation and the way we do it, usually. And yeah, until now, it worked quite well, I would say. Uh, so just a short uh, about Proteus sanguinus or Orm. It is... Uh, Two subspecies are recognized, and yeah, uh, Proteus sanguinus sanguinus that is widespread, and Parque that is uh, present only on a tiny spot in Slovenia. IUCN status is vulnerable, and of course, it's listed on the Red Book of Slovenia and Croatia. Uh, 
is the only cave, really real cave vertebrate in Croatia, listed on edge species number 18. It's third on the evolutionary distinct amphibian list, and it's so-called sexy species. Sex species because, yeah, it's uh, taxonomically it's quite different. The way of living is totally unusual, and it can serve as a good species that covers many other species that are present in the habitat and with protection of uh, orm you can protect a bunch of other species like uh, fish species or invertebrates that are present in cave systems. Uh, so it's a good thing to make collaborations and yeah, with such species you get many interested parties. Uh, what Dushan did and the Gila, uh, they checked the distribution and of course historically looking yeah it looks perfect but of course the cave, syst cave systems are quite tiny spots so they checked all of them or at least the ones that were accessible and now we have new distribution map with more data and there is well known uh, case that co goes for decades flushing out of animals during the springtime when those fish are breeding spawning then you have certain spaces where animals are flushed out. So there are tiny sinks uh, with a lot of water coming out and uh, some of orms are flushed out, caught by local people that they call someone and they call someone and they end up in zoo. We have the permit to collect the animals and usually, yeah, they, we have quite good, all of us together have quite good uh, connection with local people that are monitoring the spots when the flushing starts and then they collect animals and call us to pick up the animals and bring them to zoo later. Uh, then we got to idea to make the conservation project with the uh, Herpetological Society, mm -hmm. then with the uh, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Zagreb Zoo. It was in the moment uh, at, in the beginning, it was funded by ZSL and MAVA Foundation. And actually, the general idea was to use, let's say, those animals that are flushed out, which are natural minus for population, that doesn't really affect the population because it happens anyways. And we try to collect those animals and gain as much knowledge as possible uh, with mostly non-invasive uh, yeah, work from different sites. Uh, Hila did in situ research, of course they did the distribution records, they uh, developed environmental DNA methods to check the animals because it's not, they're not able to dive uh, into any cave system. Uh, then they did genetic tests which showed some also difference between populations, but that's not my part. Uh, then Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, they did check health of uh, ex situ animals. They checked the, all emerging uh, amphibian pathogens that are present all around the world. So we see if they are um, in problems or not. They did, micro they did microbiology, parasitology, pathohistology to gain as much knowledge about organs in dead animals, in live animals, and in, in freshly killed animals. I mean, dead animals that are uh, came out badly injured and died shortly after uh, being exposed to uh, above ground. Uh, what was interesting is that we managed to export some animals to Ghent University to see if animals are receptive for emerging uh, pathogens like uh, B-cell and it turned out to be that the species is tolerant to disease which means they can be affected, they can be carriers, but they don't uh, die out. So it is something that is quite dangerous because they can spread the disease around without being affected directly. Then we had cooperation with Isabel from Berlin. You mostly know the people from there working with uh, rhinos or elephants or big cats or turtles, but they are also good in scanning uh, amphibians. So as it is a um, species that doesn't have any morphological differences between sexes, we managed to scan them and we managed to determine sex of animals that are in the zoo. Uh, we were also scanning for early detection of uh, disease because as every other amphibian they have quite sensitive skin 
and if they are injured, they have really uh, emerging, um, uh, let's say, disease. You have less than 48 hours to do any kind of treatment if you want to save the animals. So with ultrasound, you can even find spores of saprolegnia or something on the skin and prevent it in advance. Uh, as it is quite uh, cold living species, they were also uh, looking on heartbeat rate and yeah, metabolic things that they uh, were investigating. Uh, then we also did some field trips. Uh, of course, morphology was done of the animals that were uh, dived out and released shortly after. We did uh, microbiology swaps to uh, check difference between animals that are in cave systems and that are, that are present in zoos. Also, we ultrasound them and so that, for instance, they are eating fish eggs at that certain time of year. And yeah, it's accessible during the winter time, so you have to have someone crazy enough to dive in ice and go down there. It was a douche those days. And Zagreb Zoo, of course, we are doing ex situ things. We are housing the animals. We are doing the monitoring of animals, and we try to do education. This is how it looks like when you get 10 animals flush out, and then you have some animals that are injured, like this animal. You can see the tip of the snout is reddish because this would hit in the head during the flushing out, so it has potential to die within 24 hours because of some infections. And therefore, we designed new cold room. It was ex-toilet from keepers. They got the new one, and I got the old one. It is now on 20 degrees. It is kept totally dark, and because of um, uh, veterinary things, we try to keep each animal individually, so we know what we have, and we can monitor them quite easily. Therefore, we have very simple aquariums, just water and some aeration. We use... The first animals that we got, I think it was 2012, I designed a very nice aquarium with many stones and we placed the animal inside and it was gone, it was gone the next day, the third day, after a week we still didn't find an animal. So we find out that uh, glass is much better cover for them, they should actually just feel pressure from the back and they think that they are under the stone and that they feel safe and you can easy control, easily control them, their skin and you can see uh, f uh, amount of food they have eaten and you can easily clean it so it's really looking stupid but it's practical actually this animal is in hiding place and you can easily see everything then I think it was last year or two years ago two years ago three years two years ago I think it was January uh, we opened the exhibition you will see it later today for the ones that didn't see it it's quite controversial because you are exposing animal that is not actually exposed to light, but light is at minimum level and we are still having the same animal inside without any problems and the light intensity is uh, less than it's on the picture. You have to adapt a bit and wait for, for yeah almost a minute to see something, but yeah, we are also using those glass plates and animals are in front of the glass. Just people from time to time call us and say, oh, you have broken glass that cut the animal to half, and yeah, but it's normal. And that's it. Thank you from my side. Okay, thank you, Ivan. Um, so are there any questions? I know that some of you uh, already visited the Olm uh, enclosure at the zoo. Uh, the others that didn't, I will lead the group today and show them the own. But if you have some questions for Ivan, because this is really difficult species to keep. And as we know, this is the only population, in, uh, viable population in captivity. Hmm? Again, okay, Ivan, please come. I'm, I'm back. Fluted out uh, uh, 
to, to have chance that it is not damaged by sunshine or by... So, so in other words, uh, how critical is for Proteus to be out of the cave, how, how long uh, they can survive in open area? <coughs> From what I saw, the animals that are flushed out immediately go to some shelter. And it is like uh, Dushan showed the pictures of uh, actually meadow that is flooded. So if you collect them on the entrance, you have a good chance of collecting them. If they go into the grass or into the mud, they disappear actually. So you have to just you can dig them out by luck I would say so you have to be quick and sit in front of the sink to collect the animals and see where they go probably we when people collect them they collect only I don't know 50% or even less of the animals that are actually uh, coming out because they immediately go from the sun they are exposed to yeah actually ecological niche that is not present down there sun higher temperature UV lightning yeah they should react pathogens as well, and being badly injured, most of them, yeah, because of the high water pressure. Thank you. And by the way, the animals in your ex ex exhibition are going to be darker, I, I guess, if compared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You'll see it. Okay, thank you. Some more questions? Okay, there is Simon. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, and out of curiosity, why why do you collect all the ones that's flushed out and just stuff them back in the cave? Is that not a sensible Sorry? response? The, the flushed uh, ones. Okay. You, you don't return them to the cave. You, you collect them and stay. Yeah, it's 100%, uh, they, uh, the position is that uh, uh, they don't uh, they can't get in in a natural way, so they are waste of population anyways the ones that come out, the, the, the position of sink is higher than a meadow. So they are flushed down and they are not able to get in on their own. And the problem is that they get in touch with many amphibians up there. Uh, so I think if uh, our theory is if it's happening for decades, it's a, a, a loss for population that can be stand by the rest of uh, the population down there should be quite big. It is not accessible for diving as far as I know. And so you cannot really check, go down and check. But if you have every three or four years, you have flushing, and the number of flush animals is more or less constant, we would estimate that the population down there is safe and the, that the higher risk is uh, for population to put those animals back, even if it, we would try something to do that, than to yeah, take them and yeah, see what we have, actually. Okay, maybe another one. You mentioned, you mentioned next generation sequencing, so I was curious, is it for the pathogens analysis or for something? Yeah, it's uh, generally for pathogens and uh, to try to compare um, there was one theory that they cannot be infected with uh, Batarhidium, BD or B cell, uh, because of some bacteria that are present on skin that are known to be antagonistic with those pathogens. And that's why we tested and we wanted to see if uh, those pathogens are present uh, in, um, let's say, higher number on healthy animals so that they cannot be infected theoretically, but it turned out to be that they are yeah, tolerant. So they are in that middle clade, let's say, of uh, uh, amphibian problematic, they can be carriers, which is the problem actually, and spreading around without dying, at least in short term. We didn't test for many years, of course, to keep infected animals, but yeah, that was the idea. Sorry, <clears throat> is there a predator of this species uh, to the wild? No, no. Chickens, no. people, crows when they come out, but in, in the cave system, beside the fish that might come in, it happens, I think, in some hydro hydroelectric dams when the fish go into those sinks. Uh, naturally, they are the top predator. How you feed in captivity? How they feed? They feed with uh, earthworms, uh, tubifex, hieronomus, uh, gammarus, different species, and so on. They will accept everything that falls in the water. I think that they 
way of living is that they have to eat anything they find. There is no a lot of food in cave systems, so yeah, we are lucky they are not two meters long. Otherwise, they would eat us. Yeah, Komodo Om. Um, okay, some other questions. Okay, not then we will go. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for this. And now we will hear uh, Marko Modric. Um, he's a head ranger at Priroda Public Institution. Um, they are, uh, he's working in a really nice region, Northern Adriatic Islands, to see. Uh, yesterday you saw the two movies from uh, the Rescue and Rehabilitation Center on the island of Ceres. Uh, well, he's not the guy that was jumping and hoping on the, on that these that rocks, but uh, he do a lot um, uh, with uh, with uh, um, a Griffin vulture. So, Marco, please come here. Hi, uh, once again, my name is Marko Modric. It's quite a, a famous uh, surname now in Europe <laughs> about football player. Uh, once, yeah, two years ago, I, I was uh, in, in Spain, in Madrid, so they, they treat me really well. <laughs> uh, uh, I have a really short presentation because maybe some of you uh, have seen yesterday these two movies and... Uh, it's all about uh, uh, rescuing uh, uh, griffon vultures in Croatia. Uh, why is it so special uh, to us? Because uh, we are host uh, the only population in Croatia on the few islands on the northern Adriatic. Uh, and uh, just a short overview about our institution. We are not a scientific institution, and we are not doing scientific work. Uh, our institution is a public institution for, for protected uh, area management, and we have been established uh, in 2006. Uh, lots of work we are doing with protected areas. In our county level, we have 28 protected areas and uh, over 100 Hundred of uh, Natura 2000 sites, and now in Croatia is uh, uh, we have activities uh, on the management plans for for all Natura for some of the Natura 2000 uh, sites. Uh, besides uh, managing Belly Visitor Center and Rescue Center for Griffon Vultures, uh, we have also another visitor center uh, for large carnivores in Gorski Kotar. So. If you are on the uh, way to, to northern Adriatic, uh, you can stop by. It's about uh, bear, wolf, and, and lynx. So we are doing a good, good, good part of our uh, work is education. Uh, this is the, just a geographic scope, uh, northern Adriatic, and those uh, islands uh, uh, where griffon vultures nest, you will see the, the area. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, uh, four uh, ornithological reserves in Croatia, and uh, it, it's really interesting that we had uh, in 1969 the first uh, reserve uh, in the world uh, for, for protection uh, just for griffon vultures, and uh, also some, some other uh, uh, reserves that are all situated on, on those uh, three islands, islands of Kirk, uh, Tres, and, uh, and uh, island of Prvić. Uh, in Croatia, griffon vultures were uh, really common uh, 100 years ago or maybe uh, less. Uh, uh, you can find griffons through all the Adriatic coasts and uh, also in Europe uh, and on the Balkans. There was a great population of griffons, but as you know it, uh, uh, 
lots of populations uh, had a great decline because of the mass poisoning, poisoning of uh, uh, wolves, bears, and all the predators uh, during uh, the centuries. And naturally, the population of griffons also also uh, declined. In Croatia, only on those four islands, we have now uh, griffon vultures. Uh, this, uh, this is the small village, uh, small village of uh, Bali on the island of Tres, and it's really uh, a nice place. Uh, maybe some of you have visited the island of Tres. It's, it's really uh, like an oasis of biodiversity, and it's uh, a place with no big hotels, no big settlements, and uh, it's really, really nice. Uh, we have the, this visitor center in this, small, in this uh, house. It was used to be a school, and now we... Uh, uh, refurbish it and uh, have this uh, uh, like a visitor center and, 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 and exhibitions about vultures and about uh, life in this part of the island, like a coexistence uh, with vultures and people through the centuries. I have to mention, mention also the conservation of the griffon vultures in Croatia is really uh, it's quite long. Uh, our institution uh, uh, started uh, in 2016. Before this, before that, uh, on the same place, we, we had uh, the, the famous uh, uh, also re rescue center for griffon vultures. So uh, scientists are doing uh, like a 30-year uh, job of uh, ringing birds, and we have uh, like uh, 9,000 uh, uh, recoveries of, of griffon vultures uh, through Europe and a uh, great database about them. So we know it a lot about griffon vultures, but uh, it's isolated population, and uh, there are lots of threats, so we are trying to, to maintain it resilient and uh, to, 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 to get good results for the future. Uh, uh, we have the, 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 the small, like, like an aviary for, for, uh, for griffons that we save, and uh, every year we have uh, like uh, 10 or more young, pro almost young griffons uh, and, uh, that we save from, from the sea. It's really interesting because they nest uh, on the ledges you will, uh, probably you see, saw yesterday uh, above the, directly above the sea, so uh, often they fall to the sea and we have to rescue them. Uh, we have two employees working in, in our center and rescue center, and we had really uh, good cooperation from the start with, with Zoo Zagreb, and I just want to thank them uh, every time that we call them and, uh, and ask for some advice and partnership, they were always available to us. Uh, also uh, with other uh, institutions, scientific and, uh, and NGOs uh, like BIOM, uh, it's a bird life partner in Croatia. We are doing together monitoring and, uh, and satellite tracking and so on. Uh, veterinary faculty from Zagreb for some analysis and, uh, and our founders. So there are lots of people involved in the Griffon uh, conservation in Croatia today. Yeah, uh, our activities, our main activities, uh, we are uh, doing the monitoring of breeding pairs uh, since 2017, but as I told you earlier, we have, a, like, a, our institution is doing uh, from 2017, but we have a really long tradition and, uh, of, of grief and uh, vulture conservation. Uh, beside this, uh, rescue, uh, rescue activities and uh, recovery programs we are doing in the, in the aviary and in the rescue center. And of course, releasing Griffon uh, back, back to nature. It's the, the happiest day <laughs> when we can do this and to let the birds uh, fly away. And uh, we are using today uh, telemetry. It's really popular, and uh, so we can, we can see the results and, uh, and, and check the the griffons while they are in the wild. Uh, some of them we have to recover again, but it's a really small percentage. Uh, beside this, so we are, as I said, uh, co-financing other activities like public institution, uh, like ringing the griffons in nest, and just a month ago, uh, the ringing campaign uh, uh, held on the Quarner Islands and 45 uh, new new fledged birds uh, got the, 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 the plastic marker. Uh, we are also managing the feeding station on the Tres Island. As you know, all the countries that have uh, griffon vultures or small populations are trying to, 
to get better numbers in breeding pairs and better uh, breeding uh, uh, results. So in Croatia, it's also a really big problem because the, the islands uh, where the sheep are grazing on the pastures, uh, it's also declining the number of the sheep through the history. So uh, 50 years ago, and uh, we had uh, like uh, lots of sheep on the on the on the islands and. Uh, Today, uh, the tourism is uh, like uh, transforming the the habitat and and also transforming the way of living. So people uh, are are not so eager to 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 go uh, and, and and raise cattle. So we have to have these artificial feeding sites, but it's the only way that we can uh, secure the 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 number of uh, breeding pairs. Uh, uh, you, you saw on the film, but uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, our population of griffons is really unique. Uh, you have uh, in, in, in Europe some places where griffon nests above the sea, like Sardinia and in Cyprus, I think, but uh, in Adriatic, northern Adriatic, these nests are really low. You have some 10 meters above the, the sea level, uh, there are griffons nesting, so it's a kind of... Uh, uh, really specific for for our population, uh, and uh, yeah, recent monitoring results uh, showed uh, 121 pairs uh, nesting on the on the Quarnera Islands, and uh, uh, for 110 pairs we we uh, established uh, eight, 86 uh, fledged birds in all the colonies. Uh, this year we also implemented uh, video surveillance on one nest on the Plavnik Island. So uh, this is just uh, yeah, this is an island of Plavnik. It's not protected. It's not protected uh, like those. This is a special uh, special reserve. This and all these reserves, but this is not protected. And uh, <coughs> the nests are really really low, and uh, there is a high uh, touristic pressure on those on those cliffs. So we try to. Uh, like mitigate it with with uh, some uh, implementation of video surveillance, and after that we are trying to 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 send warnings and also to patrol these these areas. Uh, this is the uh, example of uh, of uh, cliffs uh, in Croatia where where griffon nests. Uh, you can see that uh, this is like uh, island of Plavnik, and it's really really this is. 10, 10 meter from the from the sea, and when the boat comes here uh, in front of the cliffs, it's height like five, five meters. You are pro you are just a couple meters be, uh, below the nest. So when you have the incubation period, and after that the the, the fledglings in the in the nests and young juvenile griffons, it could be really potentially dangerous for them because if people are shouting, uh, young birds uh, during their first flights can be scared and uh, fall to the water. It's that, this is the main reason why we get lots of uh, young from this area uh, got to the sea and saved. And saved because uh, it's, it's really interesting because uh, lots of, uh, because there is uh, lots of touristic boats, uh, they can see the griffon in the, in the water. So uh, they call us and we, we pick it uh, and put it in the, in the, in the rescue center. Uh, the cliffs are really, uh, this is on the southern, southern part of the stress. You have some more nests here, and uh, it's really beautiful, uh, uh, beautiful to, 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 to doing this kind of uh, work, monitoring, uh, and uh, we are now facing good results from year to year. This is what, what I talk, talked about, about this uh, video surveillance and uh, this camera. One camera is looking to the, to the sea and that we can uh, see the boats uh, approaching and uh, then after this we can uh, call them if they were doing something uh, illegal or something like this. And the other, the other camera is, is, is looking to the, to the nest. This, this was like in, in, in April. And this is the same bird now. It's got a ring, and uh, now we are, uh, yeah, we are monitoring and uh, and we are waiting for the first first flight to happen. 
uh, rescue activities. Uh, it's uh, really specific. You, you saw on the film. Uh, uh, it's, uh, the terrain is really uh, not <laughs> like uh, uh, a good to approach with a boat because the, the, the this cliff are are really, really sharp and you have to be in good shape and in good balance that you can save vultures. And we have lots of situation going on because b when birds fall to the sea, they they can sometimes uh, go up to the cliff, but we are really they are really wet. They can also uh, they try to, to fly away, but uh, there is no thermals uh, above the sea, and they fall after the after the after 10 or 15 meters. Uh, recover, recover, and releasing griffons back to nature. Uh, every year we are doing this, and uh, most of the most of the birds are released back to the nature, and uh, some birds are also tagged with GPS transmitters, there, as I told you. And we get back r really good data about, uh, about uh, uh, migratory routes, and this is one year of the one uh, tagged griffon vultures. We can see that uh, in the spring, they, they, they go from Quarner to the, to the Alps, to the Italian and Austrian Alps, and then the summer, we are talking about uh, juvenile uh, uh, and uh, sub-adults that are not nesting. Then they spend the summer in the, in the Alps, and then uh, in the autumn they uh, come back to the Quarner, and then, then they winter on Quarner. Some of the individuals go uh, down south to the Greece. Uh, since 2016, uh, we, we had 61 griffons stayed in rescue center and uh, most of them were rehabilitated and, and released back to nature. 30 tagged with GPS transmitters and uh, uh, we, had, uh, we got really nice and important information of surviving rate and cause of that. On 13 occasions of these 30 tagged, uh, we, we had mortality and all kinds of uh, cases, uh, electrocution, uh, collision, collision with, with trains, uh, poisoning uh, in Greece, uh, shooting in Montenegro, and so on. Future challenges at, and threats, as I told you, uh, uh, yeah, we have to carry on with activities on feeding points, and unfortunately we cannot expect that, the, the, that people are going to uh, raise cattle, uh, so we have to uh, uh, carry on with this with this uh, activity and reduce negative tourist impact on some breeding colonies. This is the the, the case, as I uh, told you. Lots of boats are under the under the uh, cliffs. Uh, eliminate the electrocution problem, but a great deal of this uh, is also is already done on on the islands. But there are some hotspots also exist, and we are, we are trying to, to solve this. Uh, also, it's really important uh, to us because all the uh, islands are hunting areas that we can uh, try to, to implement uh, uh, lead-free ammunition because we had some uh, cases of, of, of lead, lead in intoxication. Uh, of course, uh, support and participate in anti-poisoning uh, poisoning activities and additionally improve infrastructure. infrastructure. We are now uh, closing one project and uh, doing some small laboratory in our center. And so, uh, this is really nice and, and funny, funny uh, rescue event uh, because with vultures you, you never know what's going to happen. And this one uh, juvenile, it just entered to, to the local store uh, and they we were just uh, amazed what, what was happening now. It was a young, young bird and, and it was uh, totally uh, uh, malnutrition. Uh, it, it was really weak and uh, we saved it and later we, we released it. But it was kind of attraction uh, that it's kind of that vultures, they, they like uh, need, they, they are uh, asking for help. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's all for today. Thank you, Marco. Uh, any questions? Okay, there is one, two. Okay, Marco, please. 
Don't run. <laughs> Everyone are so afraid. It's lunchtime. Uh -huh, okay. No, it's... <laughs> the lunch will be when I said so. I was just wondering about um, showing that vulture there in the, in the shot. Is that a problem with the rehab birds? Are they very familiar with people? Um, we have, no, yeah, we, we, we didn't have uh, any problems about rehabilitation and uh, familiar with people. Just it was like a specific case, but uh, as I told you, uh, lots of times vultures uh, are somewhere near the settlement and uh, those who need help, so it's kind of uh, a special connection. Uh, but, uh, of course, we found vultures uh, in the field and every, everything. But late, later, it's, it's never been to us a problem when we release the bird that it's going to go to some settlements or something. Um, uh, you mentioned the, you had some cases of lead uh, intoxication. Yes, yeah. Are there any ongoing research in... Um, in uh, diclofenac or uh, other NSAID uh, residues in the carcasses? Uh, we are doing post-mortem analysis, uh, n not we, but our partners from, uh, from um, uh, Zagreb's uh, Veterinary Institute and now Veterinary Faculty. And uh, diclofenac in Croatia, as I know, it's, it's banned, so uh, directly we, we, we cannot expect in Croatia this to happen, but as we know, our vultures are uh, uh, touring the Europe and all, all, all other countries, so uh, now we didn't uh, find any in diclofenac, but uh, this toxicology, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's getting started now, so I cannot be sure about this. Thank you. Okay, some more questions? I have a, a closer relation with uh, the Forgaria group uh, of oh, vulture. Okay. Our uh, friend Fulvio, uh, yeah. Our zoo is a <laughs> vulture specialist. Yeah. And uh, um, what's about uh, the cooperation between the two projects? Uh, do you have any relationship with the Forgaria group uh, uh, in Friuli? Yeah, we, we, have, we are like a neighbors because uh, our vultures are going regularly as you can you could see on yeah. this map uh, to to Forgaria. It's a big feeding site, and uh, and they spend summer time in Austrian Alps. But we know uh, those guys, and Fulvio is doing a great job. We annually meet when he comes to Tres, and we talked. Uh, we didn't have any any uh, uh, officially like uh, projects, but uh, you never know. <laughs> Because in uh, the end of August uh, we have uh, a specific meeting uh, every year in uh, Forgaria with uh, some presentation and uh, some zoos are there. So zoos that are interested in this room, uh, please uh, contact me. We, we can uh, organize also for you a presentation there of uh, the up-to-date information so we can share all the data. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, it's, it's and, uh, so we will, we will do because of the uh, general population is declining. Yes, yeah. But <laughs> so th this is the point. But yeah, now in Croatia we are, we are, we are expecting uh, maybe that it's going to be stable and, and it's going to up, it's going up, but you never know with vultures, uh, one, one poisoning incident and uh, you can lose lots of uh, breeding population. So we are trying to, to get uh, resilience, to get bigger, bigger population and, uh, and so, Okay, thank you, Marco. And uh, sugar at the end. Yeah. Uh -huh. da -da 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 -da. Okay, it's uh, Diana Beneta, uh, curator of mammals from Zoological Garden of Zagreb, my very dear colleague. And she will tell us more about the collaboration uh, on a project, uh, a research conservation project, uh, related to very, very, I think the cutest rodent, in my opinion, uh, that I ever saw. So it's endemic species for uh, the Neric karst area on the Balkan. It's Balkan snow wall. So, Diana, please. Yeah. 
Okay, hi, my name is Diana, and uh, I know it's almost lunchtime, so I will keep it short and sweet. <laughs> uh, I would like to tell you something um, about uh, something how can you be involved in um, conservation and um, protection of species or habitats without any money. So you don't need any money, you just need uh, to have uh, time, knowledge, and experience. Which one is it? Uh, <laughs> okay. So, talking about the sweets, um, I would like to introduce you to the cutest animal in the Croatia, especially in the small mammal department. It's uh, Balkan snowball, Dinoromis. No, it's not a mice. Please. Uh, keep it in mind, uh, and you can uh, easily, uh, it can be easily um, mis uh, uh, mislead with the common uh, wall that's on uh, this side. Uh, this uh, cute, uh, cute animal is really shy and poorly known, so what can we do? Okay, so uh, its population is uh, only uh, just over 500 uh, um, Kilometers square, square kilometers. I'm so sorry, and it habitats uh, the area of uh, the Neric Karst. You can see the, all the dots. So we will just go quickly about it. Uh, this is their habitat. It's uh, really approachable, don't you think? think? Yeah. <laughs> if you're not sure, it can also go under it uh, and over it. So you will need to be really, really, really. Uh, in the good condition to uh, even go to their area and uh, I'm really lucky to see it, see them because they're really, really shy and neophobic uh, species. But uh, if you have a chance and uh, if you see them, uh, consider, uh, consider yourself really lucky because it's a relic species, endemic species and really, really cute, as I already said. Uh, it's active almost, uh, during the, uh, almost always during the night or at the dusk on the, or in the early morning. It's very agile and fast. Uh, uh, you will see in the zoo how it, uh, um, how it um, climbs and jumps and uh, going around. It's really, really something special. It's uh, something between the squirrels uh, jump and uh, mice. So it's really, really something special. Uh, what's important uh, with them is that uh, they mark their territories and localization is really, really important uh, for them. Uh, he's a herbivore uh, and uh, what's important thing in this presentation is that, that they store food in their nest and the hideouts. Um, I'm trying to be fast. Um, okay, uh, besides they're very shy and euphobic, uh, they don't breed very, very uh, uh, fast, uh, and they have a small number of the offsprings. Uh, and besides that, uh, they are um, they live in a specialist and fragmented habitat. Uh, they have they are in the indirect competition with the snowball, indirect human action. Uh, they are uh, because of the development and uh, constructions and settlements, and they have actually the predators. So you can imagine he is not really, really in a good position. Uh, he's on the, uh, the red list, and uh, in the Croatia is strictly protected and with data deficient, and this is uh, why we need to change it. Mm, so, what we do, what we have to do, uh, as you already know, the Habitat Directive uh, sets standards for the nature conservation, and you have to do uh, the monitoring report for the species and habitat. Our ministry develop, development um, took a project uh, under the name Development and Monitoring Program for the Smell Mammals with the capacity building and stakeholders in the monitoring and reporting systems. Uh, in the red dots, that's uh, where you can go in as a zoo or aquarium or institution because you can help designing and testing monitoring programs. And in the end, uh, the results will be in a national monitoring program. Uh, this is the... Um, our decision for our um, this is the uh, this is the decision from uh, our ministry for um, uh, four uh, species that are uh, listed here, and uh, the Neric wall, uh, Balkan snow wall, is a model species, but actually it's the key species. So it's a win-win situation for this guy. This is the timeline. I can say to you this pro project started uh, just two and a half months ago. So it's a 
in really, really, uh, it's a really early stage, and we just uh, uh, get over with the um, mythology, mm -hmm. and uh, we decided which um, testing program will we. Uh, I'm just sorry, <laughs> I just got confused. Okay, so uh, we designed the monitoring program. And now, uh, at the end of the month, uh, there will be the first field guides, uh, field tours. And uh, the end of the uh, program will be at uh, 2023. So what we know about uh, biology and uh, the needs of the dinaromis is uh, really important in this kind of uh, developing of monitoring. So we know that uh, uh, dinaromis um, has three favorite spots in their um, terrarium and also in their habitat, natural habitat. They have a nest, they have a um, toilet house, I don't know how to say it, and uh, they have a storage room. So we use that information and collect all the data that we could use. So um, we were measuring the signs of the habitation um, and actually, of course, when you have the animal in the hand, you will take the body measurements um, uh, with emphasis on the vibrisse, ears and tail, because even though this is a wall, it has a huge tail comparison to the rest of the body. So it's uh, important for the photo traps also. And uh, actually what I want to say, the footprints, we uh, designed the foot trips, uh, footprint traps as you can see in the bottom line, uh, you see the paw and little dots on the pads, okay? Then we designed it uh, because uh, when you're using it and when you're measuring something, there's always human error, right? Uh, that's why we use the algorithm just to uh, remove the uh, error and we have um, actually quite good uh, measure points that will be used with the uh, footprints. Then we use the footprints, it's a, like a, a model walk. <laughs> so we put, okay, <laughs> I will shoot, sorry. So these are the prints uh, from the dinaromis that are in the terrarium. Um, then we use the, the camera traps, uh, this is another method. Uh, even though everybody is uh, familiar with that uh, procedure, and in theory it looks uh, really easy, but in uh, reality it could be tricky because you're, you need to know what the biotic and the abiotic environment are. Uh, and the first images were really not so good, as you can see, and uh, you cannot use it because you cannot tell the difference between uh, snow wall, common snow wall, and Balkan snow wall. Um, so we developed something uh, and we didn't have any money but we used the uh, cheap trick as you can see the lenses that you can buy in the drugstores <laughs> and you can use it and the um, pictures are perfect so you don't have any money or really, really little money <laughs> uh, then uh, when you know that they are sharing the, the habitat with the similar species you have to have um, determination marks okay so if you don't have any ruler, you can just bring the mar marker on the field and draw the marker on the stone. And you can then, after the uh, images, you can compare and measure the ears and the vibrissa and the tail and tell the difference between the snow wall or epidemus or something with that. So you can recognize the species. Uh, then after that, so we uh, put it in a testing in the natural sets. Uh, natural set. It's an uh, enclosure for the dinaromis uh, that uh, is like in the natural state. So uh, those guys that are uh, doing it, they didn't have any experience in the uh, setting uh, uh, cameras. Uh, they didn't have any experience with the animal. They didn't see it before uh, they come to the zoo. So this is like ultimate test and it passes. <laughs> So what were the outcomes for the guys that will go to the field? Um, they sh get, got, got some experience with the field in the zoo. Uh, they have experience with the animal handling. Uh, they uh, get used to the knowledge that we have and uh, we designed the protocols for the in situ conservation that will, they will use in the national pro program. Uh, and we decided to have uh, three um, monitoring programs. One of the, them is photo traps. As you can see, maybe I don't need to read everything, but this is like how many timeline and uh, how many uh, traps. And as you can see the 
uh, little dots and the quadrants where they will be put. Uh, there's also the foot pick traps that we used. Um, if you are, um, okay, if you want, you can have a souvenir <laughs> with a pomade souvenir. If you want them, just um, find me afterwards and I will give it to you, okay? So this is the original, you will not have it anywhere and you will have a souvenir from the endemic and relic species that can be found anywhere but here. So I think it's a good deal. And the uh, uh, last um, monitoring that we'll do is live traps that will be do in the autumn. So it's a um, regular capture marker capture method. And we will take uh, also the determination, measure, me determination, measuring, sampling for future research. So it's not just the monitoring. So what uh, are the outcomes for the people that will go to the field and in their life uh, didn't go any? <laughs> First time they will go in the for the first time in their life they will go on the the habit their habitat and try to see the animal that they they are supposed to um, count. So they should look for the signs of animal activity like a food storage or bite print uh, layer of patina. This is really important if you want to try to find the naromis. You should uh, look for this. Um, I don't know how to say it. Okay, good. Um, marks <laughs> and you see that it's not filthy there's a good uh, chance that they, they will be there and if you find the feces and the nest you're on the way you should put camera there okay <laughs> this is the uh, their habitat and uh, you should um, find them there but in the night or in the dusk uh, and we, okay, this is our uh, my um, associate and uh, I hope it will be uh, lucky because uh, please cross your fingers, they're going on the 30th of May <laughs> on the first field. <laughs> okay, I think we don't have any time for questions, but you can um, maybe, I don't know how to say it, instead of the questions, you can watch a little movie and see. I don't know how to put it. Ah. Mirko, Tomislav? Uh -huh. Where's the next stop? Yeah. How do you well, put it? She downloaded we tried it and it worked. Where's the mouse? It doesn't play very well. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, but down, down, down. <laughs> okay. So this is inside of the questions, okay? <laughs> It's not a mice. No, it's on the first slide. It's not a mice. It's a wall. <laughs> okay, you can see it in the zoo <laughs> afterwards. I would say hamster. It's not a hamster. Okay, maybe some questions. No, where, where is the lunch? That's a question, probably. Okay, uh, for sure you will be able to talk with Diana 